In this tutorial, we're going to look at uh, how to uh, create a model in Abacus. Uh, Abacus is a finite element analysis software, and it's a very powerful tool that allows you to do many types of um, different analyses, including structural analyses, but also thermal and fluids and coupled field problems and things like that. Um, Abacus has uh, several different products. Uh, in this uh, particular example, we're going to be using Abacus Standard to actually do the analysis. Um, Abacus CAE, or the Complete Abacus Environment, is the graphical user interface that allows you to generate your models and view your results. And so we will open up CAE, we'll build our model there, um, and then we'll also be able to view the output from uh, that graphical interface. Um, so to get started, you open Abacus CAE, and um, depending on what version you're running, um, it might look a little bit different, uh, but here on my computer, um, my icon looks like this, Abacus CAE, and I open it, um, and then it takes a minute to load. Um, this particular version um, is the, the full edition, it's not the student edition, um, but with the student edition you have the same um, sorts of features. So to get started, um, when you open it, open up the software, um, we see something that looks like this, where you have the um, availability to create a model, or you can open uh, an existing model. And in this case, we're going to create a new model. Um, but before we do that, I want to um, show you some of the, the main features of the, the in user interface. Um, and so basically at the top you'll see the menu bar, um, which contains uh, the available menus for a given module. Um, and in the as you're creating your model, you'll move through different modules. And as you do that, um, the features that are available in the menu bar actually change. Um, and so we'll, we'll see some examples of that. Um, later, uh, beneath the menu bar, we have the toolbar, um, which just has some quick links to um, commonly used items. Uh, and then beneath that is the context bar. Um, the context bar is very important because it allows you to see which module you're working in. Um, and then, uh, you know, more specifically, if you have multiple models within um, your file, then you can navigate between models or between different parts of a given model and, and so forth. So the, the, the context bar is very um, important for navigating uh, the model. On the left-hand side, um, we have the model tree or the results tree. Um, and this is another way to kind of visualize the different pieces of your model. Okay, so this would include the geometry that you're sketching, the mesh, the material properties that you need to define, um, the time step, the loads and boundary conditions and so forth. So you can access all of that information in the model tree. Um, at the bottom, you'll see a message area and occasionally Abacus will print um, status updates or warnings to this uh, message area. Um, and so that's just a place to, to look for uh, additional information. Um, to the right of the model tree, we have the toolbox area. And the toolbox contains um, buttons to uh, commonly used features. Um, and the buttons that are available in the toolbar depend on the module that you're working in. Um, so when you're sketching the geometry, there will be CAD-like um, buttons that are available to you, you know, to draw curved lines or straight lines and whatnot. Um, when you're creating your mesh, there will be meshing tools that will be available in the toolbox and so forth. Um, so that's kind of one, one place to go for um, the tools that you need to create your model. At the bottom of the, the viewport, so the viewport is where you can see a picture of um, the geometry that you're sketching or the, the model that you're creating, but directly below the viewport is a prompt area. And this is a very important place to look for um, messages. Um, a lot of times when you click a button to do something, the prompt area will prompt you for more information. So if you want to draw a line, 
it will ask you for the coordinates of the, the beginning and end points for the line and so forth. So, so the prompt area is important and the information that's printed there depends on uh, what exactly it is that, that you're trying to do in your model. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these modules. Um, so Abacus is divided into these functional units called modules and each module contains tools that are relevant to a specific um, portion of the modeling. And the different modules are listed here, and I'll talk about each of these very briefly. Um, and the way that you move through your model is actually going through these modules almost in a sequential fashion. So you start by sketching the geometry in the part module. Uh, then you move to the property module to define the properties, which include material properties as well as cross-sectional geometry. Once you have your part and property defined, then you would move to the assembly module to create instances of parts and assemble them in the global coordinates. Um, the next module is the step module, which allows you to create and configure analysis steps and associated output requests. And then we have the interaction module, um, which specifies th thermal and mechanical interactions between regions of the model. Um, this would include contact, if you had contact between um, two portions of the model, or if you need to define a tie constraint to tie two portions of the model together, um, that's you would do this in the interaction module. Then we have the load module, which allows you to specify the loads acting on your model, um, as well as the boundary conditions. And if you have any sort of predefined field, like a temperature, um, you would also specify that in the load module. Once you have all those pieces in place, um, then you would move to the mesh module, which allows you to select the element type that you want to use, whether it's a quadrilateral or a triangular element, whether it's a linear element or a quadratic element. Um, you would do this in the mesh module, um, and then you can generate the mesh. And there are some meshing tools that would allow you to, for example, create a portion of mesh that is finer in one particular region of the model and maybe coarser as you move further away from that part. Um, then you would create a job and submit the job for the analysis. And within the job module, you have the ability to monitor its progress. And we'll see later on this semester that this will be particularly important when we're doing um, nonlinear analysis. Um, and then once your job has completed running, then you would move to uh, visualization, uh, which gives you a graphical display of the model. Um, you can illustrate the results, uh, for example, creating contour plots of stresses, um, plotting the deformed shape, um, and as well as querying um, different, uh, you know, if you want to know the displacement at a particular point or, or whatnot. To move between the modules, um, you use the context bar. Uh, so if you go back to that earlier slide where I showed you the context bar, you can see that um, there's a tab that you can click on and um, you can you know, select the, the different module that you, you know, are particularly interested in, in working in. Um, and when you change modules, the items that are available in the menu bar, the toolbar, the context bar, and the toolbox area are all going to change. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if we go to our Abacus and we're going to create a model using Abacus standard, um, we have this kind of blank uh, model here. There's not much information. Over here is our model tree. Um, and then up here is that uh, context bar. And you can see that we can move. Um, we're, right now we're in the part module. But if we move to the property module, then you'll see that the buttons um, in the toolbox change, as well as the headings that appear up here in the menu bar. Um, and same thing if we move to assembly, we have a whole other set of tools. Um, and so that's uh, something to keep in mind if, if we get lost in our model is to think about, well, what module are we working in? Okay, but we're going to start in the uh, part module. The model tree is also quite useful um, because it's uh, a visual description 
of the hierarchy of items in a model. Um, and each item is represented by a small icon that is supposed to be illustrative of what is contained in that particular item. So for example, if you look over in the model tree um, where it says materials, you see a little stress strain diagram. Uh, if you come down to profile, you see a cross-sectional area. That's where you're going to sketch, you know, a profile of a cross-section. Um, if you move down here to some of the more, you know, advanced features, you know, here's contact and here's where you can put tie constraints and things like that. So um, they have a small icon that's supposed to help you figure out what exactly they're referring to. Um, they have a little plus sign um, on some of the items. And what that means is that you can actually click that plus sign and it'll expand or collapse the container. Um, so let me show you what that looks like over here. Um, so if I go to the assembly, you can see it's got a little plus sign. If I click that plus sign, it will expand it. And there's uh, some things that are stored underneath. Um, and then, you know, these ones that have like a number, it's basically telling me that I have one thing that's included underneath steps. And when I create a new step, that number is going to change to two. So it's going to tell me the, the number of items that I have. Um, to look at the, or to, to, um, uh, to, to use, you know, one of these features, um, you can do a couple things. You can double click on them and a box will pop up or you can right click on an item to see a list of options. Okay. So we're going to be doing quite a bit of that here in the example that follows. The items that appear in the model tree are also available in the main menu bar. So there's different ways to go about, um, uh, for example, creating a part. Uh, one possibility is to go into the model tree, right click on part and go to create, and that will create, you know, bring up the, the create a part box. We could do the exact same thing if we went to the context bar, moved to the part module, and then there is a, a feature that, that allows us to drop down from the, the menu uh, to create a part. So there's different ways to get around a model. And, and um, uh, it's more like uh, one of those things where the more you do it, the, the more comfortable you'll, you'll get with it. The problem that we're going to model is a plane stress analysis um, in which we have a plate that has a notch at the center and the plate is subjected to a pressure on either side and it's uh, pinned at the top um, but allowed to you know move uh, horizontally so we can have movement um, in the horizontal direction so those are roller supports uh, and we're given the dimensions of the plate the dimensions of the notch the magnitude of the pressure um, as well as the material properties and, you know, because we're just getting started, we're just doing a linear elastic analysis with uh, an isotropic material. Um, specifically, uh, these properties are for steel where we have Young's modulus of 29,000 KSI and Poisson's ratio of 0.28. The first thing we're going to do is to sketch our part. Um, what this does is it creates the geometry for the model. And we can create a part um, by going under our model, which is currently named model one. And we can double click on parts and a box pops up that allows us to um, define whether we're creating a 2D model, 3D model or an axisymmetric model, um, whether we are doing a deformable solid or we have, you know, rigid solid. Um, and then down here we have the base feature, uh, which allows us to define whether we're creating a solid model, a shell model, um, or we're creating a line model, which would be the case if we were creating a model using beam elements. Um, in this particular case, it's, we're modeling a, a 2D problem. So if we go to 2D planar, um, then we come down here and for the base feature, we're going to keep the base feature as a shell because what that's going to do is create a solid model for us. 
this approximate size down here at the bottom um, is kind of a, it's a way to um, specify roughly how big of a grid you need. Um, we're just going to put 20 here and click continue. And you can see that what we have here now is we have a grid space that we can use to create our, our geometry. Um, over here in the toolbox, we have various tools that are available, and, and a lot of these are very similar to uh, what you would use if you were creating a CAD model. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create two rectangles, uh, and then um, one of them will be for the, the larger plate, and then uh, we'll create another rectangle for the notch, and then what we can do is we can just trim the edge, um, the edges that we don't need. Um, so here at the, the center, so, so I click the, the rectangle box, um, and if you go down here to the prompt area, you can see that it's asking me for the coordinates of the starting corner for the rectangle. Um, I'm just going to click the origin here. Um, you can see the, the coordinates up here in the top left corner. Um, so right here is 0, 0. So I can click that. Um, and then it's asking me for the coordinates for the opposite corner. And the coordinates for that are going to be 12, 6. And you can see that um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this little X here. Uh, and I'm going to zoom out because you can see that you know, my, my geometry has gone off the page here. So if I go up here to the top and I can auto fit the view, um, you can see my, my geometry here. Okay, so we just have a rectangle. I'm going to draw another rectangle by clicking the rectangle button and picking a starting corner. Um, in this case, it's going to be 5.5 comma 0. So that's the starting point. And then for the end point, it's going to be 6.52. So there we have um, our uh, geometry for the notch. So I'm going to click Cancel Procedure so that I'm not um, drawing any more rectangles. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim these lines down here at the bottom um, so that that edge is, is deleted. Um, I think I can do that using the Auto Trim button. So if you go over here on the, the toolbox and you hover the mouse over um, this button and it says auto trim, you just click that and then it's basically going to ask us what curve we want to delete. I'm going to click that one and then I'm going to click it again to delete, you know, both segments of line that, that fall there. Okay. And so um, that's pretty much it as far as sketching the geometry. Um, it's pretty similar to um, CAD drawing. Okay, so now we're going to click Done. And we have the geometry for our plate. The next um, uh, module that we're going to work in is the Materials module, um, because we need to define our material. And so we can double click on Materials. And we can give our material a name. Um, this is useful if uh, you have multiple materials in your model or, you know, um, you want to keep track of things, you know, so I can call this steel if I wanted to, um, just to uh, help me keep track of things. Um, and then down here, I have several tabs that allow me to specify the uh, properties for the material. Um, down here I have mechanical properties, which would include, you know, elasticity. I have thermal properties, electrical, magnetic. Um, under general properties, I could specify density for the material. Okay, so it depends on what sort of analysis you're doing um, to determine what properties you need to define. In this case, we're just doing a 2D stress analysis. So we need to define mechanical properties and we're just modeling a material that's elastic. Now you can see that there are a lot of different material models that are already built into Abacus. 
For example, we can have damage plasticity models, um, hyperelastic materials, and 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 so forth. So, um, you know, as you as you um, do more advanced analyses, you know, you might be interested in um, some of these more advanced material models. But we're going to stick with elastic. Um, this is an isotropic problem. Um, our material properties are not dependent on temperature. Um, same behavior in tension and compression. Okay, so we don't have to do anything there. We just need to specify Young's modulus, which is 29,000, and Poisson's ratio, which is 0 0.28. And then we click OK. What that's done is it's created a material called steel but we have not assigned that material to the part yet. And so we need to define that um, uh, for the, the, this uh, particular part. And so we need to go to the sections and we need to create a section. Um, in this case, it's a solid uh, section, um, just a homogeneous material. And we're gonna click continue. And if we go to our edit section box, we're basically creating a section that has um, the material properties of steel. And we can specify the thickness um, at this location here. This is going to be 0 0.5 for plain uh, stress thickness. And we click OK. I've created the section, but I need to assign the section to the part. And so if I expand the part and I go all the way down here to where it says section assignments and I double click on it, then it asks me to select the region of the model to be assigned the section. And so I'm going to select this entire portion of my model just by clicking on it. And then I'm going to click done. And I'm going to assign section one uh, to that part. And we're going to click OK. And you can see that now that I've created a section assignment, my model has turned blue. OK, so if your model is not blue, then then you need to assign it a beam or not a beam section, just a general cross section. Okay, so where do we go from here? So we've done the part, we've done the property. Next thing we need to do is to go to the assembly. Um, under assembly, what we need to do is we need to create an instance of the part. Okay, because right now what Abacus has is it has a geometry that's stored as a part, but that part hasn't been created like in space yet. Okay, so we're going to create an instance of this part. The reason that Abacus does it this way is because if you had a repeating pattern, like let's say you had a bunch of bolts in a steel connection and they all had the same geometry, what you could do is you could create one part for the bolt and then using these tools, you can create multiple instances of the part. Okay, um, so, th so that's why it's set up this way. Um, in this case, we just have one part and we're just going to create one instance of the part. So if I double click on instances, um, I'm creating an instance from part one. And then I'm just going to click OK. And now I have a dark blue sketch of um, my model. And what this is telling me is that this is my instance of the part. The next thing we do is uh, we create our analysis step. So if we double click on steps, um, we can give our step a name. Um, for example, if we wanted to call this load um, to indicate that this is the step that we're applying a load in, uh, we could do that. Um, in this particular model, um, that's pretty obvious that the we only need one step. Um, and the type of analysis that we're doing is a static analysis um, and specifically just a general static procedure. So we're going to keep the default and click continue. 
the box that pops up uh, allows us to um, specify uh, some details regarding the, the time period, as well as if we go under this uh, second tab here, we can specify some information about the incrementation. This is not um, uh, relevant for you know, linear analysis uh, because everything can be solved in, in one increment without any iterations. Uh, but when we get to modeling nonlinear problems, then we will have to make some adjustments to this. Um, because it's a static problem, the time period doesn't really have any significance. So whether I increase the load over one second or 1,000 seconds, I'm going to get exactly the same result. So we don't really even need to change the time period. We'll just keep it at one second and click OK. The other thing that we need to do is to tell Abacus what output we want. Um, and so if we go to this F output, this is the field output, and you can see exactly what the default outputs are, okay? So we can see that by default, Abacus is gonna give us stress. They're going to give us, you know, displacements and reaction forces, okay? But if you had some other variable um, that you needed outputted from your model, uh, then you would go to this field output request or history output request, depending on, on what type of analysis you're doing. Um, and, and specifying what, what it is that, that um, you need as far as output. We're just going to keep the default, so um, nothing needs to change there. And then after that, we see a whole bunch of things um, that uh, fall under kind of the interactions or load um, modules. Uh, but basically, you know, interactions, if you recall, that those are like, you know, thermal um, interactions or if you have contact and, and things like that. So there's a lot of things here for, for contact um, problems um, as well as constraints. Uh, we don't need any of that in this particular problem. Uh, what we do need is we need to specify the pressure load that's acting on the edges of um, the plate. And we also need to specify the boundary conditions. Let's do the boundary conditions first. Um, the type of boundary condition that we're specifying is a displacement boundary condition. So we just select this. Um, and then as far as the step that we apply the boundary condition in, um, it doesn't matter. Like we can apply it to the initial step or to the load step. Um, regardless, what we're going to be doing is fixing displacement at zero, so we can do that either or. If we had a displacement boundary condition where the, dis the, the support was moving, then that's something that we would need to define in, in the load step as opposed to in the initial. Okay, But because our, our um, displacements are, are zero at the supports, um, then it, it doesn't matter what we choose. So we'll just keep it in the load step and click continue. And it says, select the region for the boundary condition. Okay, now what I'm going to do is select the points um, where the, the supports are going to be applied. And what I'm doing is I'm holding in on the shift key as I click on these points so that I can select multiple points. Okay, um, and make sure that you just have the points selected, um, not the edges. And when you have all four of them selected, then you click Done. And we're restraining it in the two direction or in the Y direction, OK? And we're setting that to be 0. Um, and so we go ahead and click OK. Now, if I just left my model like this, it may or may not run. Um, because part of the problem is that there is no support or no restraint in the x direction. And so um, even though my loading is symmetric, uh, even though you know my geometry is symmetric, uh, I could do everything that I want to try to make sure that this thing does not move in the x direction. But some small numerical imperfection could cause my structure 
to become unstable and just roll all the way to the right because there's no restraint in the x direction okay so if i were to run this model i may or may not get an error that my stiffness matrix is singular so what i'm going to do to avoid that is i'm going to put another displacement boundary condition and i'll put it down here at the bottom and i'm just going to put it in the x direction and so now I've restrained my model against rigid body displacement. So uh, I, I shouldn't run into that error um, when I run my analysis. Let's now define the loads. And the load that we have in this case is a pressure load. Um, we make sure that we're applying that in our load step. Um, we can give it a name if we want to. Um, and then we click continue and we're going to select the, the edges. And click done. Okay. And the magnitude is going to be 10.3. Um, and we need to make sure that we put this in the right direction. So um, if my memory serves me right, uh, then positive pressure means that the pressure will be acting outward from the body. Let's see if that is correct. No, it is not. Okay, so you can see that my pressure is acting inwards. So what I need to do is I need to go back to my load, double click on it. I need to change that from a positive to a negative to flip the direction on the pressure. And now you can see that the arrows are correct. Okay, so that's one important thing to keep in mind is that if you do make a mistake in your model, you can always go over here and edit it. Okay, so, so no worries there. Okay, so we have our part, property, assembly, step, no interactions, and we defined our load. So now it's time to mesh. Um, the way that we're going to do the mesh, um, I don't know if you noticed when we created our instance um, but when we created our instance type we're defining the mesh on the part and so where i'm going to access the meshing tools is i have to go over here in my model tree expand the part container and go down here to where it says mesh and it's empty i'm going to um, specify my element type and it's going to say select the region for the element type just select the whole thing and we're going to model this um, let's see so if we we have to choose we're, we're using abacus standard so that's the element library for the family this is where we were going to specify that we're doing a plane stress analysis and we're using plane stress elements. Geometric order, we'll just do a linear analysis like or, or with linear elements. Okay, we could model it with quadratics if we wanted to, um, but we're not going to bother doing that. Um, and then down here, there's all kinds of things that, to specify for these elements. Um, and we'll talk about a lot of these options here as the semester progresses. Um, so things like hourglass control and um, uh, hourglass stiffness, um, reduced integration, incompatible modes, okay? Like all this stuff is, is things that you need to know about um, in order to uh, use these elements properly. Um, for the triangular elements, um, same thing, you know, we have some, some things spe specified here. Okay, let's model this with triangular elements. Um, and so what we have here is we have a three node linear plane stress triangle. Um, so the, that, the key for that, or the little specifier is CPS3. Um, so that's the element type. We'll click OK. Now the other thing we need to do is to assign mesh controls 
And this is where you would go if you wanted to um, do stru a structured mesh versus doing free meshing. In this case, we're going to try to make the mesh a little bit finer around the notch. Okay, so we'll keep it as free meshing, but we want this to be triangular elements. We don't want to use a mix of quadrilateral and triangular elements. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to choose for our mesh controls. Then we go to uh, seeding the parts. Um, so let's play around with this a little bit. So seeds are kind of a rough layout of how big your elements are going to be or what your mesh is going to be. Um, so we can specify an approximate size. This is in the units of, of length that we have here. Okay, so this would be like an element that is one inch in length. Um, and there are some other controls here. Um, we're not going to mess around with that, but let's just go ahead and click OK. OK, so that's kind of where the, the edge nodes are going to fall. Um, and then we can say mesh part. And click yes. And that's what our mesh is going to look like. Um, because this is a problem where we have stress concentrations around the region with the notch, we might want a finer mesh around here. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually change the seeds so that we can have a non-uniform mesh. Okay, so let's seed the part, but let's hold in on the button and you see that these other buttons pop out here. Okay, so anytime over here in the toolbox, where you have a button that has a little black triangle, that's telling you that there's more than one button available there. Okay, so you can see the part or you can delete the part seeds. Um, I'm gonna delete the part seeds. Just click yes, and it's prompting me like, do you really wanna delete the mesh? And I'm gonna say yes. Okay, so instead we're going to seed the edges And um, we can use uh, bias. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting these two bottom edges. And um, we can define uh, local seeds um, by size or by number. Um, we're doing bias, so bias means that it's going to be finer on one side than on the other. And the sizing controls, so we want it to be, um, the maximum size is going to be 0.5, minimum size is going to be 0.1. Um, that sounds fine to me. Um, so let's go ahead and apply that. Let's see if we did that correctly. And we did, so you can see that the mesh is a lot finer here. Um, now, if you're operating in the student edition, you might find that that's too fine of a mesh and you might need to change this, okay? So instead of maybe 0.1, maybe maybe you want to do something like um, 0.25. And instead of 0.55, maybe you want this to be 1. Okay, so we, we change the, the fineness of that, that spacing, okay? Um, so go ahead and click OK. Um, and then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to assign seeds along these edges here. Um, but in this case, I'm not going to do bias. Uh, so let's go ahead and unclick that. And then we're going to select our edges. And these ones, um, no bias, approximate element size, we want to be uh, 0.25 and click apply and that looks good to me okay um, and then for the remaining edges no bias approximate size of one inch and we click ok so that that looks better to me so let's go ahead and mesh it and you can see that we get a mesh that looks like this Okay, um, and we will talk about best practices for meshing um, as it gets, uh, as we get further along. Okay, 
Last thing we need to do is to uh, submit our job. So we double click on jobs. Um, we're creating a job from model one and you might want to give this a creative name um, because Abacus is going to store your results under what you call the job and the default is job one. And so if you create every model to output as job one, then it's just going to keep overwriting your results. So if you want to save the results, give this another name. Maybe it's CEE510 notch plate. And we click continue. Um, we don't really need to worry about uh, any of the, the features that, that show up here for the analysis that we're doing. So we're just going to click OK. Um, but if we expand the jobs container, there's our job notch plate. Right click on it and we go to submit and it will submit the analysis. And it will take a few minutes to, for the analysis to finish. So you can see now it's saying it's running and now it's completed. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is that you can always go to this monitor box and this is good for troubleshooting your model. Okay. So if you're finding that um, there are a lot of iterations that are being performed um, and there's not supposed to be, um, then you can figure that out here. Um, but also any errors in the model, any warnings, um, and, uh, you know, any other information, you know, there was a warning here about um, the, the thickness, the fact that we defined a thickness of 0.5 as opposed to one, um, but it, it still ran, so no issues there. Okay, now to view the results, we right click on the job and we go to results. And at first um, we just see a green version of our model. This is the undisplaced shape. If we want to plot the displaced shape, um, we can just click on it here. So plot deform shape. And that's what the deformed shape looks like. Other things we would be interested in would be like the stresses, okay? So we can um, plot contours on the deformed shape. And if we go up here at the top, we can choose what what uh, quantity we want to, to pick, okay? So for stresses, they're showing us the Mises stresses, but maybe we want, um, you know, the S11 stress, or maybe we want the maximum in plain principle stress, you know, so, so there's um, different uh, quantities that, that we can get out of our particular model. Um, other things we would be, might be interested in are knowing, for example, like how far does this point displace in um, the model? And so we can go to, um, Tools, Query, and we can query a node. Okay, so for example, this node right here. And if I go down here, um, uh, there's kind of a, a text printout of, um, let me make this bigger, you know, the, the base coordinates. So this is kind of the original coordinates. Um, and then the deformed coordinates, which would be here. Um, it also shows me the scale factor that it's applying when it plots it up here um, in the, the viewport. Um, but then we can also get the displacement. Um, and so that, that point moves to the right by six times 10 to the minus three inches. Um, so a very small displacement. Okay, um, so there's a lot of different things that, that you can get out of the model. Um, and, and so we can talk about uh, different things you might be interested in um, uh, as we get closer to the, the project and so forth. But for the time being, um, you can kind of look around here. You can get the form shape, stresses, 
you can get reaction forces, um, pretty much any anything the, that you might want out of the model. Okay, uh, last thing is saving the model. Um, so let's go ahead and save this. Um, the model is stored as a CAE file uh, and the results are stored as in the ODB file. Um, so what we can do is we can give this a name, CEE 510 notch plate, and we just click OK. And so now uh, when I come into Abacus, I can um, just basically open the CAE file and it will take me directly to the model. Um, I'm in the results module right now, or the visualization module. Um, so I can go back if I want to make some changes to the mesh or to the loading. I can do all that um, by going by using the context bar here to, to go back and forth. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the example.